Welcome to the Blunt Calvinist, where we focus on Reformed theology and the biblical truths. In this video we are going to break down a video from Leighton Flowers and his disdain for the truths held in the Bible. Leighton claims to have at one time held to the Reformed beliefs, but now claims that Calvinism and Reformed theology is heresy. Please watch this video all the way through and comment on your thoughts. I will periodically inject some thoughts and scriptural references to help you better understand just how much Leighton hates the gospel and how he wants to set his will above God's. Let's get started. It feels like somebody just punched me in the gut hearing that. So if we'd like to say this, that John Calvin articulated the same things that Paul and Jesus in the early church believed when he fought the heresies of Jacobius Arminius with the Synod of Dort. If that's what we mean by Calvinism and articulation of the biblical truth, then sure, Calvin and I would agree on a lot of things. I guess I should clarify. What I really meant to ask is you believe that who is a believer and who is not believer is the sovereign choice of God, correct? Okay. Yeah, in fact, that'd be one of my main arguments with the perseverance of the saints argument is that belief is not, not the choice of man. It's the choice of God. Okay. If belief is not a choice of man, it is a choice of God. Why do you do what you do? Because I mean, my heart made me the face. Okay. But you're never going to convince someone to believe in God because only God can do that. So what is the purpose of telling people about God if the only way they can come to believe is if God chooses to come and move them? Because any kind of evangelistic efforts, I have a 100% success rate for the kingdom of God. So either it is going to add to the condemnation of vessels prepared for wrath for destruction that will, God will use to glorify himself. So we'll be adding to the condemnation of unbelievers where God will be just and destroying them for eternity. Or he will use the preaching of the gospel in the way he pr primarily has, which is how he draws his elect to himself. So I have a 100% success rate with whatever I'm doing because I'm accomplishing God's purpose either way. You could also look at it and say you have a 0% success rate because anything, anyone that comes to God is was predestined to do so before you even existed and what you had to do had nothing to do with it. Yes, God doesn't need me to do what he's going to do. It is a privilege and an honor to be used by the sovereign God to accomplish his purposes. I think the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I'm, I'm The chief end of every man or just the elect men, Joe? Leighton is an educated person. He has degrees and holds a doctor's title. He should know this. Let's break this down for him. Universal purpose. The purpose to glorify God and enjoy Him forever applies to all humanity. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. All people are created to reflect God's glory. For the elect, only the elect fulfill this purpose fully. Due to sin, humanity falls short of glorifying God. Romans 3 verse 23. The elect, those chosen by God's grace, are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out this purpose. Ephesians 1 verses 4 to 5 tells us that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. In summary, while all are created to glorify and enjoy God, it is through Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit that the elect can truly fulfill this purpose. Reformed theology emphasizes that our ability to live for God's glory and find joy in Him is a result of God's sovereign grace. You have a 100% success rate because for the reprobate that you're preaching to, you're increasing their condemnation. That just hurts me to the deepest core of my being. I just cannot fathom that someone would say to an atheist and an audience of people that I'm successful in my causing you to be even more condemned than you were born as a reprobate by teaching to you the gospel. That's the purpose of what I'm doing here. I, for, if you're a reprobate, my purpose in being here is to bring heap, higher levels of condemnation upon you. Are you serious? Biblically speaking, every time you go out and preach the gospel to a crowd, you are yourself heaping condemnation on those listening who never repent and die in their sins. Christopher Hitchens in a debate once said, By evangelizing me, you are adding to my suffering in hell. A loving Christian would not evangelize to the lost so that the amount of condemnation in hell would be less. You are a hypocrite. In order to help the unsaved by your logic, 
you should not preach the gospel and that would lessen the condemnation upon them. Calvinism is consistently applied how damaging it is to the kingdom of God and to evangelism efforts. That is absolutely, unequivocally, demonstrably false. The Bible never speaks of evangelism in preaching the good news. The good news is somehow heaping higher condemnation upon those who God didn't choose in eternity past or who God ultimately reprobated in eternity past. Greater Judgment In Luke 12 verses 47 to 48, Jesus teaches that those who know God's will but don't act accordingly will receive a severe beating, while those ignorant will receive a lighter one. This suggests greater knowledge leads to greater accountability. Sure, I don't know his heart. I can't psychologize Joe here, the, the Calvinist, but he seems he doesn't seem to have any sort of compassion for these people. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem to have any kind of a, and again, I, I can't, I, 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 you know what? I'm not going to go there. I, I don't know. I don't know his heart. Um, and I, I shouldn't say that. It just, it doesn't come across to me like he does. Maybe deep down he does. Everybody expresses emotions differently. Let's just be honest. Um, sometimes I come across as not being emotional about something or feeling about something. And, and it's just because of the heat of the moment. So I, I, I don't, I, I can't say what Joe's heart is. I don't know his heart. And so I, that's wrong for me to, to, to say that he doesn't have a compassion for the lost. He may uh, have a great compassion for him. I have no idea. What I'm saying is the way in which you're expressing these things makes it sound like you don't. And therefore you're affecting the way people are hearing you. And therefore the people who are hearing you in this, this lady, this granny and the, her audience are hearing this kind of cold hearted, I'm here and I'm hundred percent successful because if you're elect, I'm going to win you over. And if you're not, I'm heaping condemnation on you. That, that really does come across. Like, I really don't care so much about you. Um, and whether you intend to come across that way or not. You and I are both very religious for what we do. We just are on opposite sides and we have different religions. If you found out that God chose not to save one or more of your children, okay. how would you feel about that? It means he's God. See, God, God is a bigger being than I am. He's higher than I am. And I sure hope that God has chosen my children. And one of the assurances that I have that he most likely has is that he's placed them in my household to be raised under his admonition and nurture. But if God chooses not to save my children, that is his prerogative because he is God and I am not God. He decides who's in his heaven. He decides who's in his hell. Romans 9 is really clear about how God handles that. And because he's God and I'm not, I don't get to sit over him in judgment of that decision. That's his decision to make, not mine. So it's not only possible, but it's also very likely because the way is narrow and those that are chosen are few. Yes. It is very likely that at least one of your children is not among the chosen. That is possible, yes. And it is very likely that God predestined one of your children to an eternal torment in hell. That is possible. And you don't have a problem with that. Okay. We've got two ways to look at this. This is a glass half full or glass empty. Either I can rejoice that God chose a wretched sinner for salvation, which is me, or I can worry about God choices with other wretched sinners. When I realize that the human nature and the human position against God is that I've sinned against an almighty God and that everyone deserves his judgment, I should be mystified, shocked, and stunned whenever he chooses anyone, not surprised when someone doesn't get chosen. Take a breath. Take a breath, Leighton. I've watched it twice preparing for this and it's still just, I mean, I, the, it feels like a sucker punch. It feels like, it feels like somebody just punched me in the gut hearing that. Um, and I'm trying, I'm trying not to react in emotion. I'm really not, I, I, but man, I may have to pause. Okay. God help me. Um, Okay. Gather yourself, Leighton. All right. When, when someone asks you a question that's obviously very emotional, um, very, very hitting home. I mean, your, your children, I think this guy has a lot of children. Um, and, uh, 
And it's very, very likely, as she's pointing out, that one of them is not elect. And is that, is that, are you good with that? And of course, he's, he's God. And then, and then he goes on to explain from that vantage point that, you know, we should be shocked that God would even show mercy to one person, not shocked that he would condemn somebody because of how horrible and heinous we are. Is that, is that the message you get from Jesus and his life that we should be shocked that he would be gracious to even one person? Honestly, after reading the gospels, I would be shocked that he would not be gracious to even one person because of how gracious he is saying, teaching us to stop and help our enemies and to love one another and to give of ourselves and go the extra mile and dying on a cross for the sins of his enemies, the people who are condemning him, the people who hate him the most. And he's saying, forgive them, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I, I would be shocked to find out that Jesus doesn't show mercy or love for even one person. And yet Calvinism is teaching us, you should be shocked. You should be just absolutely baffled that God would show mercy to even one person. What? What Bible are you reading? The Bible teaches that God loves and shows mercy for God so loved the world that he gave his son. The whole message of the gospel is God loves you. He wants you. Yes, the chief end of man, to, to love God and glorify him forever. That's what he wants for every man, not just a select few that he arbitrarily picked before the foundation of the world or unilaterally picked, whatever word you prefer. Because God is love. doesn't say God is wrath. God is love. And he loves that which he created. And he sent Jesus to demonstrate his love for the world. And he wants every single man, woman, boy, and girl to love him and glorify him forever, to know him. And he sent Jesus to help us to know him and to have a way of salvation because no one can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And so to say to this, to this woman, one, I have a 100% success rate because if you're a reprobate, I'm here to heap burning coals on your head. I'm here to ultimately bring more condemnation on you by preaching you the good news, which is not really good for you at all. It's really bad news. As a matter of fact, it's bad news for most people. If you happen to be one of the elect, then it's good news for you, but it's bad news for everybody else. Um, I, I think that does such huge amount of damage to the gospel and a huge amount of damage to our efforts as apologists and as evangelists. Um, and, and I think that's why we have to do better at standing up against the rise of Calvinism, because if it's not affecting this generation as much as you think it will, wait until the next generation and the next, because history repeats itself. And look at the effects of what higher and higher forms of Calvinism do to the church and do to apologetic and, and evangelistic fervor. And I think you'll begin to see really quickly why this kind of teaching when consistently played out and thank God many Calvinists don't consistently play out their theology as consistently as this guy does. But when you see it playing itself out in real world apologetic conversations and evangelistic conversations, you can begin to see how utterly damaging these kinds of beliefs are to the cause of Christ and to just the the those who are seeking things think about how many people in this audience who are just seeking to find clarity maybe maybe struggling maybe looking at both sides and this is the representation of god they get and that, that's why i think that this has to be this has to be confronted here is a list of bible verses that describe the state of man these texts cannot be ignored yet leighton denies them or denies their meaning if leighton is correct in his theology then God wants to save every human but because of man's will, he cannot. This is synergism, a combined effort on both parts, and places God's will under man's will. This makes God a failure. My God is not a failure and has a plan, and his plan is not dependent upon my will. God's perfect plan will come to pass. Please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing. Also, share this video. Here's a list of Bible verses that highlight the depravity of man. Leighton seems to want to ignore what the Bible teaches. Romans 3 verses 10 to 12. None is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, 
and desperately sick, who can understand it? Romans 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 64 verse 6. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Psalm 14 verses 2 to 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside, together they have become corrupt, there is none who does good, not even one. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Mark 7 verses 21 to 23. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Genesis 6 verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Romans 7 verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Romans 8 verses 7 to 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 